Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Payments Association and SWIFT, welcome to today's webinar on the AI revolution in financial services, opportunities, risks, and the path forward. My name is Nick Kerrigan, Head of Innovation at SWIFT and member of the Payments Association Advisory Board. Before we get started, I have two quick pieces of housekeeping for you. First, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to access it on demand within the next 48 hours. Look out for an email from the Payments Association on how to do so. Second, if you have any technical issues or questions during this webinar, please send a message through the chat box on Zoom to Christina Gatens from the Payments Association. So let's get to it. In today's webinar, we have a stellar lineup of speakers for you today. And we'll first hear from our keynote speaker, Patricia Florisi, Technical Director, Office of the CTO at Google Cloud, on what is happening in AI today. Following that, there will be a panel discussion, Navigating AI in Finance, a view from the experts, where we, we will dig deeper into the opportunities for the application of AI in financial services. During the panel, there'll be an opportunity to send your questions to the speakers. Please do this via the Q&A box in the Zoom. You can also ask questions anonymously if you would prefer for your name not to be attached. Finally, we'll end today's session with a case study, Fighting Payments Fraud Through Global AI Collaboration, discussing a pilot program collaboration between HSBC, Deutsche Bank, and SWIFT. So without further ado, let's go over to our Chief Innovation Officer at SWIFT, Tom Zatch, for his opening remarks. Thanks, Nick, and thanks everybody for joining us today. This uh, webinar comes at a, a really timely moment. I find it personally impossible to keep up with all of the announcements and hype and, and things that we seem, seem to be coming out of, like every day. And, and, and I think we, we all can be certain that AI is going to revolutionize the way that we work, the way that we operate, uh, and the way we basically do everything in the world. And so today, I hope we can give you a little bit of uh, detail and provide some clarity for you in terms of where things are going and, and, and how it's being assessed across the uh, industry. And it is cutting across multiple industries, every industry, I think, you know, in ways of uh, automating repetitive task and improving decision making and and even enhancing customer experiences. So I think I don't think there's an industry that's not going to be impacted by AI and we're already seeing that. And in financial services and we're going to spend some time on this today, you know, institutions are really trying to scale up the adoption of AI in response to new opportunities uh, and evolving regulatory environment um and even even uh, evolving threats. And some of those you know threats are are business competition, otherwise are are, are related to cybersecurity. So, so lots of drivers, you know, for to kind of scale up the adoption and and complete the exploration and see how we can try to get some things into production here. And I think you know, gen, generative AI in particular really creates a, a significant uh, opportunity to create value, a new business models, um, new innovative products and services, and and really just a significant way to boost all kinds of new content. And again, we're seeing that today. And and for financial institutions and for for um, for banks and for our ecosystem, you know, we're starting to see those uh, starting to see those take shape. At Swift, just to give you a little bit of uh, information in terms of how we're approaching this, um, we you know really with our position being a kind of a trusted entity in the heart of the financial services, we feel like we're in a really unique position to leverage AI for the benefits of the community and be able to do that at scale. And scale is really key here. And we see lots of pilots and we see lots of POCs and we see lots of experimentation, but ultimately we're not doing this to run science experiments. We're doing this so we can actually uh, provide value for our community. And I think our ongoing um, AI experimentation really kind of underscores the, the immense potential uh, that we see with, uh, with AI coming into the, um, into the industry. So you're going to see some some uh, news and announcements from us uh, soon. We're not going to make those today, so so kind of stay tuned. But one of the things I did want to also highlight for Swift is that it's really important to underscore the fact that everything that we do is done responsibly. Um, it's it, it's it's how we operate, and it's what our community expects from us. So we spent a lot of time building strong governance frameworks and really aligning the way in which we operate to the emerging global standards and regulations that we see coming up around the world. So again, very exciting time, uh, kind of opportunity to change everything and a good opportunity today to kind of dive into um, and look at some of these specific items that we're working on. 
So thank you again for joining us. And, and what I'd like to do now uh, is to hand over to our keynote speaker, Patricia. Um, I'd like to offer a warm welcome to her. And um, she's the technical director mm -hmm. in the office of CTO of Google Cloud. And she has some really interesting insights and some updates that she'd like to provide for us today on AI. So uh, Patricia, over to you. Thank you, Tom. And it is a pleasure to be here today. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, we, today, we are going to talk about the uh, an overview of AI trends. The main question is, what is happening in the world of AI today? Uh, if we could please go to the next slide. Uh, what is happening in the world of AI today? How did we get to large generative language models, which we are introducing December of uh, uh, 2022? So I actually have a, a little bit of a story to tell you. The year was 2013, uh, 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 exactly 10 years ago, and Google actually shared a paper uh, called the efficient estimation of work representation in vector space. And I'm sure uh, it was not a big hit on the reading list. Uh, but what did this paper actually shared was how Google was trying to solve for the problem or the eternal quest of search. Suppose that you are actually on Google search and you should ask for a picture of a cat, an orange cat. Now, Google is trying to predict what else you must be interested in. So you must be you may be interested in a uh, a pet like a, a cat, uh, like a dog, or you may be interested in a picture of animals with interesting colors like a flamingo. Uh, or you may actually be helping your child on doing your homework and you are interested on things that have four legs, such as a table or a chair or a desk. So Google wanted to actually go from the original question of a cat and end up on a chair or a table. So one, one of the people at Google thought it would be really useful if I had a table that looked like this. The table would have for each thing in the world, let's say that you have 20,000 things in the world. So you would have one line per thing. And here we are going to simplify here for you. We are going to put the three lines for in green for the cat, the dog, the flamingo, the animals, and three lines in blue for the table, the chair, and the sofa. And it would be interesting to have columns that talked about properties of the animal. You had columns that talked about properties of the furniture, and you had columns that were neutral, that were properties that talked about each one. And we wanted to fill out this table in the following way. In the, in the cells where you have uh, uh, properties of animals and the, the, the rows of animals, the values would be very high. For the columns where you have properties of furniture and the things are related to furniture, the values were also high. But for the other cells, the values were very low. So if you had properties of furniture for the lines that had cat, dog, and flamingo, they were small. And for the ones that are applicable to both, the values would be neutral. And we said, hmm, if we had such a table, then we would be able to go and search from cats to dogs, from flamingo to tables, and so on and so forth. What the paper actually shared was that Google had found an algorithm. And the algorithm was as follows. If you had a table with all the things in the world as rows, and you had 768 columns, which seems to be a magic number at Google, uh, and you gave the algorithm a obscene amount of text that described things in the world, the way that the words appear together, like the cat and the dog are my favorite pets, or people talked about cat and cuddly, and people talked about dog and cuddly. By just observing, measuring the frequency in which those words appear together, we could train an algorithm to automatically populate this table. And this was really a crucial moment because we didn't need any human whatsoever to be giving those numbers. We didn't need the definition of the columns and the table was fully automated. And this particular role that you have in the table is called an embedding. 
So this is the magic behind the word embedding is a specification of a thing in the world in this particular case as a cat, as a collection of numbers, we call this a vector that belongs to a table. Now I'm going to tell you a couple of magic things about what you can do with embeddings. So suppose that you take the table below and you simplify the table into three columns. You calculate the average of the green, the average of the blue, the average of the yellow. And now you have a table that only has three columns. I can then represent everything in a three-dimensional graph. And voila, if you go to the next slide, that's how Google organizes every single world, word in the world. And when you actually search for a cat, we consider the cat the center of a sphere. And depending on the additional questions that you have, or depending on the uh, areas where Google wants to expand, we follow either the dimension of a pet or the dimension of similar colors or sim uh, dimension of four legs and so on and so forth. And we use that not only for um, a Google search, but we also use it for videos and other things. So this is the first fundamental concept. Embedding is the codification of things in the world as a vector of numbers. Then four years passed and we were playing a lot with embeddings and we published another paper. Attention is all you need. This time around, we confused the technologists because they thought it had to do with psychology. But what we were trying to show is how Google was trying to solve another problem. Suppose that you want to do translation and you have two sentences. The first one says the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. And the other one says the animal didn't cross the street because it was too white. And what you wanted to show here is that the word it in the first sentence is related to animal. And in the second is related to street. So the way that we actually managed to do that was by using a similar concept, the concept of embeddings. But what we did was we trained an algorithm not to understand how similar the words were across all of the other words in the dictionary, but we actually trained the algorithm to understand the embedding of the word relative to the embedding of every single other word. So we trained an algorithm that when the embedding of a word like animal gets multiplied by the embedding of every other word in the sentence, we can understand that animal in the first one was more related to it, the, and animal in the second one was more related to street. So what we did was we took the concept of embedding, of codifying a word in numbers, and we applied to understand how dependent every single word was to another word in a sentence. And by understanding that when we say, we see the sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too, we can autocomplete and give in and give the word tired because we actually understood not only that it in this particular sense was related to animal, but it was related also to a uh, sentiment. The, the we call these models large language models or LLMs. And why? Because first of all, they are related to understanding language, therefore a language model, but they are also very large. They can compute the relationship between thousands, hundreds of uh, uh, thousands, tens of thousands of words. And we can only do that because we can do these operations in parallel. This architecture that multiplies these embeddings in parallel is called a transformer. And that's how you bring it all together. This concept of parallelism is very, very powerful because it gives us ability to scale at unprecedented level. The two building blocks of large language models and embeddings that you came to know in December, 2023. And then you can ask, hey, why did this show up only December uh, 2022? I'm sorry. And where has all this technology been? Well, this technology has been immersed in every single application that Google has 
including email, including uh, um, smart composer, sheets, everything else. So you say, hey, is this only applicable to Google? Absolutely not. It matters today because all of this technology is available to you. This technology can not only be used in workspace, in Gmail, in Docs, but very heavily in the financial industry. And I'm going to give you only four examples. In the capital market research, it can be used to actually efficiently synthesize and summarize financial research in a matter of seconds, in a matter of minutes, and across a body of knowledge that is unprecedented. It can enhance business technology by automating routine and manual tasks, that especially the ones that are related to FP&A. In document search and synthesis, I kid you not, I tell my husband all the time, I don't care how good you are at actually organizing our papers, we can now quickly identify and summarize the contents of documents, contracts, and every single agreement we have signed in a matter of seconds. And also, of course, it, ha it helps you in regulatory, financial, and, uh, um, and compliance. So basically, a technology that understands language can summarize not only the stories of Harry Potter, but every single financial document that you have in the industry. These happened and you became aware starting December, 2022. And then you may ask yourself, what else is happening in the world of AI? And I always like to joke that at Google, there are people that are not afraid of trying new things. And here you have four people that actually said, hmm, I actually can understand text and I can under understand text using transform architecture. Can I apply this to picture? So the idea that this group of people had was to actually cut the picture of uh, a cat. So let's say in nine pieces, which we call a patch. So imagine that you have a scissor and you cut the picture of a cat in nine steps. And you actually organize in a way that you put the first row and then the second row and the third row. And the experiment was done not only with cats, but with dogs. So if you look at a cat, this is how a human sees, this is how the machine sees. And if you have never looked at a cat before, this is how you learn the cat looks like. So we did this with the dogs. We did this with the flamingo. And we use the same pattern with all of the animals. And then we fed during training or what is called pre-training, we gave all the pictures of the animals and the labels. And during inferencing, which happens when you run a trained model, we gave a picture of an animal and the uh, machine was able to recognize that it was a cat. What is transformational here is that the whole process of transform architecture and embedding that was applied to language could now be applied to image. But we didn't stop there. We said, wow, if it can be applied to image, it can be applied to a video because a video is a sequence of images. So if you think of an image as a sentence, a video is a paragraph. So we put the paragraph, we did with the video the same thing we did with the images and we fed into the machine. And when we put the three frames, um, not like this, but like this, and we put the, the videos in the machine and we said, hey, please autocomplete. The same way that you would autocomplete a sentence, it was able to infer the next image that would appear in the sequence of uh, um, the movie. So the, the same concept, the same transformer architecture be, became applicable to an image as well. And here is a key slide that I would like you to, to take a look because what happened was the same transform architecture, the same methodology was applicable to every single data modality. But we didn't stop there because we said, hey, we are using slightly different variations of the transform architecture for each modality. So we published a couple of more papers. And what we managed to do in these papers was to use a single transformer architecture that could take text and image without any modification. And then we said, okay, if I can use the same architecture for text or image, can I put it all together? 
And that is one of the most famous uh, experiments that were done. It's called the Flamingo experiment that during pre-training, we sent a picture and we send a text that describes the picture. And we taught the machine how to take a picture and add a description. And now when during inferencing, we say, we put a, a picture of a flamingo and we say, this is a, the machine can actually autocomplete and say, this is a flamingo. They are found in the Caribbean and South America. So we taught the language model, how to start from an image and find the text. So if you actually go to, uh, to this picture here, I want to pause and uh, have us reflect. We are humans. Humans have many sensors. We see, we smell, we touch, we see, uh, we um, uh, feel flavors, we can hear, we can touch, we can experiment with three dimensions. For the, but how many brains do we have? One. For the first time in history, you have machines that are capable of getting information from several sensors that we call modality and funnel all of that information in a single transformer architecture, a single brain that can understand not only each modality individually, but establish to create connections among them. And this is a, a historical moment. So with parallelism, we were able to do this with a, a single transformer architecture we got to standardization. And with standardization and parallelism, we got scale. We can combine together all these processing units and process information at an unprecedented um, speed. And that is one of the major uh, breakthroughs um, that we have. If we could please go um, to the next slide. These are the three most important um, uh, things that are happening. And because of those three, we were able to advance a sequence of models and get into the era that we call the Gemini era or Gemini 1.5, which is not only multimodal, but can have a window of over 10 million parameters. And you can say, hey, what can I do with 10 million parameters? You can put the entire Les Miserables book do, uh, drawing from a kid and ask, what is the page that uh, uh, mentions that particular scene? Uh, this is just for entertainment. You can do that with the financial sector as well. I wanted to finish this presentation by saying we are living a historical moment in life. And people typically say there are three types of people on earth, people that make it happen, people that watch it happen, and people that do not know what has happened. It's a historical moment. Google is here with Swift. What can we build together to transform the world? Thank you very much for the opportunity of talking today. Thank you very much, Patricia, for that. Uh um, super insightful uh, keynote. And, and as you said, we are indeed at a historical moment. I honestly didn't expect the orange cats would uh, feature today, uh, but I've understood the power of the orange cat and not only the orange cat, but the power of the, the LLM, the transformer model and the ability to do uh, really hypercomputing at scale with AI. Uh, and so I think that we're really, um, it's an exciting place then to take the conversation. Uh, and so I'm now going to go over uh, following your keynote, Patricia, to Rachel Levy, Head of Enterprise AI and Enablement of Swift, uh, for the next session of, of this webinar, which will be a panel discussion on navigating AI in finance, a view from the experts. And I'm hoping these experts are as inspired as I am by Patricia's keynote. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks, Nick. Um, and agreed, Patricia. Super fascinating to understand in a bit more detail the mechanisms behind generative AI and also how this has evolved over the years. Uh, with these recent developments such as transformer architectures. And I think that leads us nicely to this panel where I'm joined by three experts to talk about the applicability and reality of AI within financial services. Um, so I'm joined today by Sean Townsend, a partner of Data and Analytics at Oliver Wyman, uh, Dara Morrissey, Director of Data and AI and Worldwide Financial Services at Microsoft, and Paul Ward, the Head of Strategy and Data and Analytics at NatWest Group. Um, so in the next 40 minutes, we will be discussing how AI is already reshaping the financial services landscape. Uh, we're going to dive into some key topics such as governance, 
And also we will hear from our experts um, some insights into how both enterprises and individuals can navigate and leverage AI's transformative power. Um, before we dive in, I do want to remind everyone to ask uh, any questions you may have on the chat uh, and engage with these great speakers. Um, I'll be checking this throughout uh, and answering any questions um, at the end as well. So I think to start, one key thing that stands out to me as we consistently hear about AI is that over the years, we have seen the progression uh, and hype cycles of a number of innovative technologies. Uh, and each of these have huge levels of excitement, interest and promise. Um, so, Sean, I want to start with you uh, and hear how you think maybe AI differs from some of these other technologies that we've seen in the past, particularly for the financial services industry. Well, I think one thing that uh, we've already absorbed today is that AI is, in fact, not new. But, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to become an overnight success. And certainly since the design revolution uh about a year and a half ago now, it's not just awareness in AI that's increased, it's investment, it's the technology that has really accelerated, and we definitely are looking at a paradigm shift now. I agree with the comments earlier that this is a really exciting and historic time. And that structural break is similar to the invention of electricity, the personal computer, the introduction of the internet. and one thing that we've learned from those sort of paradigm shifts before is that honestly we don't know what's going to happen you know the internet was created to monitor a coffee pot we could see the potential for it to bring information together nobody really understood how well it was going to bring people together with sessions like this or indeed the the downsides and potential for online harm similarly with uh, the introduction of the personal computer we thought it would help secretaries type faster. We didn't really see how it was going to change the way people worked. And there is an element of that with AI and particularly with generative AI because the capabilities are emergent. But even more so than those previous shifts, it's accelerating really fast. Uh, and that's partly because we have more people getting involved and honestly, more bad actors beta testing it like nothing else. I mean, human nature can be a terrible thing, but the adversarial nature of the way that people are testing tools and, and trying to see what breaks them, testing where the limits are, means that the tools are getting better much faster than anyone would have predicted. The other thing, though, that we've seen in previous technology developments is a productivity paradox, and that's absolutely what we've seen over the last year. And what the productivity paradox typically means is that you get an initial slowdown before the acceleration. And everybody's waiting to see when the world is going to get leaner and faster, whereas in fact, initially things just seem a little bit more complex and there's no great return on investment that comes absolutely immediately. And that's partly because we are truly awful at measuring productivity. Um, we're not very good at spotting what changes the quality of life for the individual or when a person is more productive as opposed to a company-wide systematic change. But that's also because before we can really grasp this opportunity, we need to change processes, we need to upskill the people, we need to change the way that we operate, our risk governance, our data, how we access the data, and we need to work out how and when we can actually use this technology. But uh, the use cases are already coming out, and I believe that we're at that turning point where productivity is about to really accelerate. Thanks, John. Yeah, you mentioned there that the use cases are coming out, and I think, Dara, I want to hear from you. Given your role and the experience you have across the financial services sector, I'm interested to hear what are the top use cases that you see already adding value in financial services now? Uh, and actually interesting how maybe this has evolved with the advancements in generative AI that Patricia discussed in, in the last year or so. Yeah, so first off, great to be here, Rachel, and agree 100% with, with Sian. It's, it's, um, this technology is incredibly accessible, I think, you know, and what's amazing is when I meet customers and I meet a ton of customers uh, on this across the world, uh, they're walking into the room knowing exactly what they want to use it for. 
I think that when I think about use cases, um, I sort of think of this in three waves. You know, we've had predictive AI in in this industry for years. But what I would say is that the benefits of those use cases like Nest Best Action and Fraud were very pointy in those businesses. There was no killer use case. And um, what happened with generative AI was the use cases became broadly applicable across the organization. And as, as Jan said, it's a product, it's a huge productivity accelerator. So when I think about use cases with generative AI, the first wave has been mostly internal insider organizations. Um, you know, we the one that's most mature is actually with developers. That initially started off like code generation, but we have we have people using it now to understand legacy code, uh, document that code, fix bugs in it, and you know we've we have good numbers as well and good data on on the productivity there. It's around thirty to forty percent uh, improvement in developing new code. So, I think the other use cases that are really popping for me uh, are in the contact center. You know, understanding the conversation with your customer. Um, we can do a couple of things in this space. We can document or transcribe the conversation, understand this, measure the sentiment. And then there's another use case which was developed in parallel alongside this, which is around building knowledge bases. You know, so a lot of banks, what they did was they started doing knowledge bases around non-sensitive data. It could be, you know, the, the employee handbook or their financial products. And what's really exciting for me is those two use cases are coming together, you know, um, as, as, as conversations come into the bank, what you can do now is start to learn from every conversation. So if a, an agent answers a call in a particularly good way, we can push that into the knowledge base. And what essentially you're creating is a, is a bank that's learning from every conversation. I think the, the next wave of use cases then is around how do we help advisory roles get ready for meetings? You know, they have to log into lots of different systems to get ready to meet clients. Um, I think it's going to come out to more into the customer channel. We've got we've already got that happening in capital markets. You know, we have a lot of companies like BlackRock, Morningstar, Moody's. They're building these Gen AI co-pilots that help you navigate that market data. Um, and I think, you know, even, even what you saw this week at OpenAI, I think that's going to open up even more natural interaction with the customer. Sorry, yeah, it's interesting how you're talking about the, the use case of software development. It's something we've recently started exploring at Swift and actually mm -hmm. um, seeing that the same results that, that you discussed where it's not just about code creation, it's actually about documentation of, of legacy code, it's around testing code. And, and I think, Sean, you touched on this, but it, it's far beyond what you can even predict in terms of what the technology can do. And until you get your hands on it and start testing, you really can't understand the potential. Um, so, Paul, I wanted to, to turn to you, uh, and I, I want to understand a bit about what's going on in NatWest in terms of exploring AI and some of the, the experiments mm. you may be doing or the evaluations that, that are going on. Cool. Thanks, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I just uh, I, the, the short version. This is Adara. Yeah, tick. We're do, doing that. Um, <laughs> and so, so I guess we've we've been using. AI very successfully already for se several years um, in the bank for, for driving customer benefit and process simplification and focusing on efficiency. I think by by um, really applying it well, we can really drive a, um, personalization for the customer experience, uh, managing risk a lot better uh, and protecting customers um, whilst we also help our colleagues with the quality and efficiency of, the, of their work. Um, it's it's something I think a few years ago um, was quite a niche topic. I remember um, probably five or 10 years ago ed trying to educate people internally in terms of what's machine learning program versus traditional programming and, and how things have changed since then. Um, one of the things I think is quite ironic is, is now all the kind of things we were doing around um, generating insights using machine learning um, you know, for years now is now called traditional AI. Um, uh, with the rise of generative AI and large language model multi use, um, which which is which is fascinating and a bit ironic. Um, so, kind of where are we to to pick up on pick up on your question? I think we 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 now have across all the the estate of the bank's analytical models, we actually have about fifteen percent of them that are using some form of AI and machine learning in there, uh, which is which is really good progress. Uh, we've got uh, our uh, conversational chatbot, uh, Cora out there um, last year, for example, that handled um, uh, 10.8 uh, million uh, retail banking customer conversations. And half of those pretty much uh, didn't need any human interaction. So uh, this is really ramping up in terms of our, our use. 
Um, I think Dara mentioned it. It's a classic uh, example for analytics around financial crime and fraud detection. We have like 6,000 colleagues that are using some of those tools to identify the key trends and educate and help our customers, but also then spot things like people that are most vulnerable to becoming victims of crime, like um, scams, for example, which is, which is terrible in society. Um, but looking a bit longer term, AI is really helping us understand our customer needs. So um, we've got a, a series of models that we've deployed that are really looking at uh, predicting longer term needs over five years and how do we maximize uh, customer uh, lifetime value over that. They, those models take in over a thousand pieces of, of uh, internal and external data and I use a whole suite of machine learning models to, 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 to drive that and, and, and get value for our customers and, and for ourselves. Um, and I do think before I talk about generative, I, uh, just a, a comment from earlier. I mean, I think this is still a huge amount we can do with, let's call it traditional AI, just in terms of deployment at scale across organizations like financial services. I, I don't think we've really tapped into that yet fully. Um, so generative AI, I mean, I, get, I guess that's a mega, mega hot topic as, as we, is obvious from this. A couple of examples from customer services that we have. So um, we've got a, a new cloud-based uh, uh, contact center platform and with 7,000 colleagues on it. Um, and we're already using things like enhanced uh, uh, customer tran uh, transcription and sentiment analysis and the things that uh, D Dara mentioned in there. Um, but now we're also then looking to expand it into some of the other the other kinds of areas I mentioned, like how do we uh, get smarter at um, time to search and find and summarize documents to help our colleagues deal with customers. Um, so really, we're looking at helping driving. How do we improve our, um, uh, our call center performance and, and consistency about how we deal with customers? Um, one of the other interesting areas uh, we're looking at is then really around how are we improving um, uh, our interactions with relationship managers, with customers, but helping use AI to actually summarize calls to help the relationship managers focus on the customer a lot more and then needs and actually talk to them rather than sitting there scribbling notes in meetings. Um, so that's a really, really huge um, area I think we'll be we'll be focusing on. Uh, overall, last year we did a we did a study across the bank and we found over 100 potential use cases across our different business areas really focused on, on simplification and, uh, and productivity. We really do see there's some material opportunities to go after in that space. And now we're, we're actively working through how we scale that up um, in a responsible way that I'll, I'll come on to later um, in, in terms of how we do that and how we drive that simplification and, and productivity agenda ultimately to better, better serve our customers. Wow. Um, so it sounds like a, a lot, but it would definitely be uh, remiss of me to not uh, ask you to follow up on, on the responsible AI comment. Uh, we hear a lot about AI governance from privacy concerns, risks and, uh, and regulation. Uh, and Paul, it would be interesting to hear from you um, what do you believe AI governance actually entails for a financial services enterprise? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question because the you obviously leap to kind of what do you not do? But I've, I've tried to think about uh, about two different aspects. So one is, um, you know, how do, how do you actually responsibly grow and manage a portfolio of how you're leveraging AI um, going forwards? And then, of course, the, the the other side is how do you deal with it in terms of control, regulation, the risk associated with it, um, et cetera. So 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 on the first aspect, um, I think how, how do you look to grow the portfolio in a considered way? We've been trying to distinguish I think two classes that Dara mentioned, which is uh, one is where do we have process specific use cases that we can focus on? Um, so that could be a particular customer journey or product or something. But as we do that, we're trying to understand the patterns of how we deploy generative AI and make sure that they're reusable so we can start to scale them up. We don't have point solutions all over the place. Um, so that's really then working with people, our architecture teams and things like that. Um, but then the more general case, this is the kind of AI on everybody's fingertips, if you if you like. Um, firstly, the, the case is mentioned earlier on in terms of uh, software engineering and really trying to drive the whole software development lifecycle, be that coding suggestions, generation, testing, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but then the much broader class of how are we starting to use the end user computing tools like uh, Copilot built into Microsoft Office, for example, to really help you know vast thousands and numbers of colleagues in, in our organization and others really really um, uh, help them generate and be benefit from those tools going forward. So that, that's the distinguish, distinguish sort of approach we're taking uh, to on that. Uh, on the 
on the sort of uh, responsible and, uh, and embedding piece, I think the um, clearly um, we've got to manage the potential risks of this and, it, and it's top of everybody's mind. It's really got a, a huge focus uh, in the bank. Our CIO is uh, Mark, Scott Mark is uh, sponsoring the AI work and our, our strategy. The bank has a technology advisory board uh, that gives an external perspective from, from experts on it. Um, taking a, a kind of you know an ethical approach to data and responsible AI use, I think is going to be the right thing to do, irrespective of the regulations. Um, but clearly, uh, I'm sure some people are familiar with the emerging regulation in this space, particularly the EU AI Act, um, how that gets interpreted in the UK. Um, and then obviously for global organizations, the challenges of dealing with different regulatory environments and the, the differences that, that that causes. But really making sure that um, we're communicating out guardrails to, to a wide audience in the bank in terms of the education on this about do, do's and don'ts uh, and, and approaching it like that. Um, I guess thinking more broadly, there's there's probably a lot of good things that organizations can be doing in this space um, already. So, like I said, communicating out um, principles internally, looking at training programs, looking at an enhanced uh, control environment. Um, one thing I'm really keen about is making sure it's not a silo of kind of AI controls and things like that, but really looking to enhance how the existing control frameworks of financial services organizations are lifted up to cope with AI. So an obvious area is, is model risk uh, controls that everybody would call out. But then other areas, you think front to back in terms of product development, marketing, communications, and rights of things like supply chain management at the other end. So it has a wide impact that, that organizations need to think about from an enterprise point of view. Um, and then really trying to think about like data and AI literacy um, would um, probably be the last last point. I think it's it's not just about the techies here, um, how do we educate business leaders and people that own processes to understand what AI can do for them and, and open the possibilities to them, but also then make sure that they understand the, the risks um, uh, and the pitfalls of, of using it. Um, and probably just lastly, uh, it got mentioned, but I think there's a the fairly obvious one around um, things like keeping keeping any organization, keeping customers data safe um, with, a, with an increasing threat landscape as well is going to be um, uh, really important too. So there we go. That, that's probably a whole day's worth of seminars we could have on that, but that's a bit, a bit oh, of an no, insight. That's great. Um, I, I agree with you, Paul. I think it's really important to, to, to realize that it's a collective effort across an organization to really embed these topics within existing processes, existing governance. You know, teams across an organization need to be upskilled and actually ready to evolve and their ways of working as well. So I definitely agree with that. And I think Swift is taking a, a similar approach. Um, Dara, were you gonna jump in and add something there? Yeah, just that, you know, we we, we have a held set of uh, responsible AI principles uh, that we've had for years, uh, but what we've done is tried to codify these now uh, into our products as well. So for example, um, we have a whole set of responsible AI filters and they essentially keep the, the conversation that you're having from going sideways. So we actually put this into, um, the Mercedes car, we put the power chat GPT in there. So you can ask it for safe things like Irish uh, roast dinners, but you can't ask it for tips to rob a bank or something like that. So um, but we're, we're investing a lot there. And I think the other thing that we're working through is with regulators as well. I think a lot of the regulations are kind of sectoral now around data, but um, we will see, um, you know, I think, I think that there's, there's some challenges with predictive versus uh, generative AI in terms of things like transparency that we're working through. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's, the good news is that I see most banks I see doing very risk proportionate things. Nobody's doing anything silly with this technology, which is the good news. Brilliant. Um, we talk about AI principles often, and there's two uh, areas that I think come up all the time, and that's around explainability and bias. Um, and so, Sean, I really want to hear from you on that, but but maybe for those in the audience who aren't clear on what those terms are, uh, when we talk about explainability in AI, we're really referring to the ability um, of a consumer to understand and interpret how a model has arrived at its output, its prediction, or, or its decision. Um, and that, as Dara mentions, is really about making the reasoning post process transparent. Um, Bias, on the other hand, is um, skewed or discriminatory outcomes that a, a model may come to, um, either based on prejudice in the data or in the model parameters themselves. And I think we constantly talk about these two 
term, the importance of explainability and avoiding bias. Um, but maybe, Sean, you can talk about how firms who are leveraging large language models can actually um, think to address these two areas uh, and what they can be doing to enable that that trust. Yeah, well, the, these are the, the right questions, but the, the hard questions. Uh, I mean, when we say large language models, sometimes we're just talking about processing text um, and dealing with unstructured data. And sometimes when we talk about um, LLMs, we mean the, the generative ones like chat, GPT and Llama and so on. And uh, the reason that distinction is important is because explainability is hard. But if you're just analyzing text-based data or image-based data, explainability should be a, a solved problem. Actually getting a model to tell you which bit of text drove that decision, what would have changed the decision, uh, that's actually a fairly well embedded and straightforward process now and we see most banks being able to do that fairly routinely when it comes to generative AI where it's actually produced the text and the content. The explainability is really hard. The model itself doesn't know where it's got that idea for and it's designed to be unpredictable. It's meant to give you a different answer every time, which means that even counterfactual testing where you try and change the question and see what effect that has can collapse around generative AI. There is a move towards working with uh, smaller, more specific models. That's helped a little bit in terms of the explainability, but it's around generative AI, more of a trend towards how do we work with and increase awareness of this risk, that there is a lack of uh, transparency around the decision logic of the model, rather than as yet solving the explainability. Similarly, um, we're hoping that causal models are on the horizon where you can actually be a little bit clearer about what leads to each decision, but it's still a long way off. Around the bias side of things, there's been great progress in terms of creating more diverse training sets, but bias control is not just about having a great training set. Even a neutral model can affect different people differently and have a, a disparate impact. So we need to get even cleverer about the way that we control models, not just the diversity in the data set and the counterfactual testing, but also looking at monitoring the outputs and having that framework that assesses how different outputs can affect different people. And um, I just wanted to echo again what Paul and Dara are saying about how regardless of the regulatory pressure coming in, banks have already got really good at this of saying, well, you know, these seem like neutral variables, but could they potentially affect different populations differently? And how do we make sure that our models perform fairly is a question that it's not easy, but it's already one that banks have really got their teeth into and are, are struggling with. We can't quite come up with a single metric for fairness that's going to work in every case, but we've certainly got the, the right frameworks in place already. Um, with generative AI, again, fairness becomes more complicated. We're looking at subtly gendered language or overly westernized image, but also these models are sycophantic. You know, they're, they're not optimized to be accurate. They're optimized to be credible, and that means that they want to please people. Um, and so they're basically little ma manipulation machines. They're very good at telling you what you need to hear. And that means that they will be biased because we're biased. You're going to create an echo chamber if not sufficiently monitored and controlled because it'll tell you what you want to hear. Uh, and whilst the regulators won't ever be prescriptive on this is how you must measure fairness and this is what is fair enough, they are starting to really work on aspects such as disinformation and the potential for generative AI to give a misleading response. Basically though, um, I think that we've got a, a disappointing level of alignment on this uh, panel if you did dial in hoping for conflict because <laughs> uh, the, the other two have already you know, said so many things that I agree with in terms of the fact that you just have to, rather than hoping to be able to get rid of all the risk, we need to instead develop controls to mitigate the, the risks, really understand the technical limitations of the model and only put them into process in places where that's an appropriate limitation and that's an appropriate risk to have. 
you know, we can increase the transparency and it's not just on the developers, it's on the C-suite to also be upskilled enough to be able to ask the right questions about how are we using these models and can we feel comfortable with the risks that that brings? Thanks, Sean. Um, I, I also agree with, with all three of you and I think it's such an interesting discussion. Um, I, I like the term that you use, optimize to, to please. Um, and that does actually spark me with a question about trust, right? If these models are not optimized for accuracy, but they're optimized to please the consumer, how do financial institutions uh, and also vendors actually ensure that they keep the same level of trust that they have with their customers today as they're going to start using uh, some of these public models? Maybe, maybe Dari can take that one. Yeah, I think one of the things we're, we're working on is really getting to... Um, an answer where we're we're not eliminating hallucination completely, but we are uh, giving you as much discrete, up to date information as possible, and also giving you citations. So if you search a knowledge base now, um, one of the things we can give you is the link back to the page in the document where it got the answer, and actually we can show the decision process there as well. So I don't think we're ever going to completely. Uh, eliminate this you know we're, we're, because it's a reasoning engine uh, sometimes it will actually reason to please as Sian says but I think where we are working uh, you know how we're mitigating this are with things like plugins where you're actually going outside the model to get the answer um, get a real-time answer as well it could be you know what is my balance sheet or what is my balance on my account or what's the stock price you know so then it becomes um, the, the, the gap becomes smaller and we have we have traceability as well. But that that's I think that's gonna I think I think this is gonna evolve all the time. I think if we have this panel next year, it's gonna be completely different. I don't know what that looks like, but I think it's gonna be yeah, very different. Thanks, Sarah. Um so before we go into to Q and A, um, with only a few minutes left, I really wanna discuss uh, something a bit more tactical. Uh, and that's approaches that enterprises and individuals can actually take to, to navigate this uh, new revolution. Um, so firstly, on the enterprise side, I think one thing that's apparent from what all of you say is that there's a pretty large cultural shift that's going to need to take place to become a data and an AI driven organization. Uh, and that can be quite daunting. Um, so Dara, maybe from the experience you have in engaging with a number of organizations, uh, what, what advice do you have in, in terms of shifting the cultural mindset across a, a large organization? Yeah, I think the good news here is um, I think banks were CEOs were trying to do this pre-generative AI, but it was, it was like pushing a rock uphill because the value was very concentrated on, on smaller use cases. What happened with ChatGPT is uh, CEOs got very excited about it. You know, if you look at Davos uh, last this year, there was all the CEOs were talking about it and they are really keen to have it. And then in organizations, what we're seeing is a, is a sort of swell from the ground up. You know, people are um, actually using this. Uh, it, it's it's very similar to what happened with mobile and cloud. We had this concept of, of shadow cloud and shadow mobile. And I think we see shadow GPT. We actually had a survey published last week where it was, 70% of employees, knowledge workers, are use, have used some kind of generative AI in the last year in your organization. So that means um, I think what's what's happening here is the organizations that are doing it successfully are, are sort of capturing those two waves coming together um, and educating, educating organizations. What I also see really exciting is that business and technology teams are coming together in ways that I've never seen before. And this industry... Um, typically moves slower relative to other ones, but I have never seen, uh, I've never seen our team.